wants to play both sides of the fence. He's getting sick. Get back on. Good evening and welcome to the Week in Review. I'm Paris Schutz. A raucous week in city and national politics. And if we don't get it, nobody should get it. Thank you, Madam Chairman. The City Council Black Caucus's attempt to delay the rollout of legal pot sales fails. Madam President, I'm, I'm, I have the floor, sir. I have the floor. I have the floor. I thought you were concluding. I, I, but I still have the floor. You all wanted the vote, so we're taking a vote. But was the raucous meeting a sign of the second coming of council wars? Lori Lightfoot moves to ease weed smoking rules in cigar shops and hookah lounges, as the mayor's top lawyer and city council battles issues over residency and tax breaks. The president stood on the White House lawn in front of TV cameras broadcasting around the world and called for China to interfere too. President Trump is impeached and the Illinois House delegation votes along party lines. Joe Berrios, who was once one of the most powerful politicians, is now reportedly under federal investigation. And in sports. Packers looking to hang on. They just set it up to Cohen, looking for some blockers. Tariq Cohen, now he's going to throw it backwards. Ball is dropped, coming up to get it's Trubisky, making moves, still on his feet. This play is still going. Horstead's got it. Ball is loose on the ground, and it is going to be it. Ball game. The Bears' playoff hopes are dead, so what's next for the beleaguered team? Joining us are Craig Delamore of WBBM News Radio, Becky Vivi of WBEZ, Laura Washington of the Chicago Sun Times and ABC 7 News, and freelance sports journalist Lester Munson. All right, let's get to the top stories of the week. Craig, when was the last time in your coverage of City Hall that you saw a meeting get that wild, contentious, with that many layers of parliamentary chess playing and a vote that was in doubt until the end? I don't think, per frankly, I don't think I've ever seen one where the parliamentary procedures became the big story. But uh, we've seen a few raucous uh, meetings. The last time I saw it get uh, that crazy was during um, the uh, Indoor Clean Air Act when cig uh, banning cigarettes indoors and Oddly enough, foie gras. Got, <laughs> got, 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 the banning foie gras got kind of crazy. It's always a really important stuff. The issue about yeah. marijuana. It's the big issue. Yeah. <laughs> Becky yeah. Vivi, what to make of these parliamentary maneuvers? There were four votes to decide on whether to vote on this right. pot delay. It seemed like they were making this up as they went along. Right. Well, you know, it's it's interesting because one of the longest serving aldermen, the longest serving alderman, Ed Burke, was suspiciously silent. He is rather silent these days in city council, in part because he's under federal investigation but you know the folks running the meeting were checking with the corporation council what do we have to do next and I think there were you said three votes to decide on if they're going to vote now on the actual measure so you know what to make of this I think it's it was a spectacle 
It was a spectacle. Yeah. Laura Washington, in the old days, if everyone was uh, confused about what the rules were, you go to Ed Burke or right. Pat O'Connor, and sure. those folks are gone now. Sure. Well, Ed Burke was silent, I think, because the last time he spoke up in the council, right after Lori Lightfoot took over, he got slapped down by Lori Lightfoot right. verbally. <laughs> and so, but ironically, she could have used his help in terms of <laughs> he, 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 the old timers like him, Pat O'Connor, some of the other ones that are gone from the council. They were really the only ones who really understood the rules and knew how to manipulate them in, in, in although, their own interest. Although he did help her by voting uh, in he her voted, favor uh, each right. time on this. Lester Munson, does this sort of game playing signal council wars as sometimes reporter Franz Spielman says this meeting reminded her of? I, I don't quite see how, uh, Franz Spielman is the best City Hall reporter aside from Craig. No, no, <laughs> that I, I, that I, I, I see about. that title to <laughs> Franz, but, he is the but best. I, I don't see it as council, council wars was viciously racist. It, it was, it, it was, it made what's going on in Washington right now look tame, I thought. With Verdoliak and Burke doing what they were doing to Harold Washington, it was vicious. It went on and on and on until finally Washington and Judson Minor, his lawyer, got the remap of the district. So, no, I, I don't see it. Maybe just the volume and the kind of rollicking atmosphere, but in Council Wars, it was just pounding on the mayor. It's a different thing. Sure, it's, it's apples and oranges, but Craig Delamore, if, you know, the vote came down to about 29 to 19, I yes. think it was. Are there more difficult votes on the horizon that she might have a tougher time cobbling together a majority? I, th I think there are going to be, and, and I'm not sure it's going to matter as much about uh, whether the subjects are the big earth-shaking ones. I think it's a matter of whether or not she's going to be able to take more power away from the alderman, for example, in things uh, like uh, the uh, uh, dispensaries for marijuana or the... Or the I think it's going to come down to little battles about how much authority and how much strength the aldermen still have. And aldermen, the Black Caucus aldermen were insistent on holding this up until more, uh, there was more minority representation in dispensaries. Becky, what, um, what do you think pushed this over the hump for Lori Lightfoot and Governor Pritzker, who also didn't want this delay to happen? Well, it does sound like there were some kind of behind the scenes uh, deals about adding a couple of, of additional dispensaries for black owned businesses. Um, via the state provisions. But I do think that, you know, the Black Caucus really wanted to hold this up um, to, again, get more minority representation. But I also think that they, as a caucus, want to, as, as Craig was saying, show their strength. Um, they, do, they do have, I think, the largest number of people. The city council has a few different caucuses, and they are the largest one. But they don't always um, vote together, and they're not always a block. And so, you know, I think what I'm watching for is this math problem of, of who is is staying together in a block and do they have enough to go up kind of toe-to-toe -to -toe, toe -to -toe with the mayor. And, and they didn't vote in a block on this. There were some African-American aldermen like Walter Burnett that defected, got up and said, I know you guys are all mad about this, but I'm comfortable with it. I think that enough minority representation will come down the pike. What do you think? picked him off. Well, I think that might have been those behind the scenes negotiations with the governor where they, but the, the challenge here was that the state law did not provide for what the aldermen were demanding. Right. And they came pretty late to the game. They, they came in, we, this, was, this law was negotiated for months. It's been, in, it's been in place for months. Now at the last hour, you know, a couple weeks before it's supposed to be enacted, all of a sudden we want to complain. Well, you don't have a lot of leverage, as, as Lori Lightfoot pointed out, when you come in at the last minute and you don't have an agenda. It reminds me of the whole LeGuan McDonald issue where the Black Caucus, along with many other aldermen, approved that that settlement for LeGuan McDonald's family, not having seen the video, not knowing all the details. And for a relatively and then, small amount of money. Right, right. And then the after, the fact, they're, and after the fact, they're like, oh my goodness, what happened here? We don't like this. Well, they're not better, prepared and they're not, they're not totally educated on the issues. It, isn't it better, though, if they're arguing and they're taking positions than a 50 to nothing vote? Oh. I mean, oh, I think that's the, great. It's, it's certainly better for observers. Right. It's this certainly is, more yeah, fun that's to that's watch. You don't know what's going to happen. I think this was one of the examples of the, the law of unintended consequences because when everybody got all hot about it was when there was the lottery to choose the uh, dispensaries, the mm -hmm. original 11 dispensaries, and no African Americans, no Latinos right. were even eligible. Because, to, and, because of the way the law yeah, had been set up. And, and yes. then everybody said, wait, yeah. this was supposed to be a social equity 
uh, program. But what Pritzker says is it is because it's going to provide funding and assistance exactly. to future entrepreneurs, and hopefully a chunk of them will be minority. Right. And I think the glitch here is that people didn't realize that what was written essentially is that those owners who already own medical marijuana dispensaries, they're the ones that got the first crack in the lottery. And to those the point, if they were caught, yeah, and they were caught, you know, Aldermen at the local level were caught kind of on their heels. They were like, oh, crap. We didn't realize <laughs> we didn't, this. We didn't count or look into who owned medical. And, and the pod czar, Toy Hutchinson, the state's pod czar, says, well, you never complained uh, during medical cannabis when you knew that all these owners were non minority. Right. I think the interesting thing, too, is that it seemed as though the tone of their complaints were more directed at J.B. Prisker, at the governor, than they were at the yeah. mayor. Uh, they want to play it safe with Lori Lightfoot for now, but the, it's easier to go after the governor. In, in, and the governors could have a problem there in, because uh, the African American votes are a huge part of his base. Including an unsubstantiated claim by Alderman David Moore that the governor was threatening to stop capital projects in the South and West Sides and if they the, didn't the uh, governor's office vote against is, this. is denying that. Uh, and they're saying, no, there, there were no threats made. But the governor was certainly active, and his people were certainly active in this. And it may not have been threats, but it certainly was urging them to keep the program going because some of the funding, the funding for the inclusion programs, the training, the financing, is coming from the initial marijuana sales. So they're saying if you stop the if you stop the program, right. you you're also funding. stopping the part of it that's going to give you what you want. Eventually, and it's that eventually and one of the that where it's breaking that, that down. He has is he has people like Toy Hutchinson and Christian Mitchell, top former legislators who were very respected in the community, going to bad for him and saying, "Look, making the argument that you just made, Craig." And they're, and they're African American. Another thing we learned from this council meeting is the word "bump" uh, <laughs> as a as a verb, as an yes. action word uh, that we didn't really know of before. And well, some people did. Walter <laughs> Burnett. It sounded like he was using a profanity to dismiss a heckler. In fact, he said. Bump them punks, bump them, bump them all. Mm -hmm. it, bump, bump that is, in fact, vernacular that is heard in a number of neighborhoods. And frankly, yes, it is a substitute for, for profanity. profanity. <laughs> but, uh, but, it, but uh, you know, I, I'll have to admit, I don't have any independent recole recollection of Walter Burnett actually using direct profanity. Right. Uh, I, I've heard him say, uh, you know, BS. But uh, I think he probably, and I heard a B. I actually, because we were right. listening on, we were listening on speakers in close the chambers. To us. It was right. muffled, and it certainly yeah. sounded like but another we, we, word. But we're looking back, back at the, the tape, it was definitely the, yeah, bump. It was definitely bump. Yeah. It's funny that he took the Walter Burnett took great umbrage at the fact that some reporters mistakenly reported it as that yeah. other word. He said and it was tweeting out. It was tweeting right, out, right. But so. you know, we know what he. The intent was, you know, yes. pretty much the same. The message was the same. All right. So, uh, Corporation Counsel Mark Flessner, he says his intent was not to claim two homeowners exemptions, one on a home in the suburbs like and a home eyes. in the South Loop. Uh, Lester Munson, when Mayor Lightfoot uh, campaigns on bringing the light in and transparency, is, is this an issue for her campaign? I, I think, her, I don't think it's a it, campaign issue. It's an embarrassment for the lawyer. There's no question about it. This guy was a federal prosecutor. He works at Holland and Knight, an international law firm, and he doesn't know how to do a homestead exemption. I mean, come on. You, get, you don't really believe it's that. It's the one though, you live. He doesn't know how to do it. He knows how to do it. He did it twice. To you know, save that, some money. Was it an accident? No, there's no way it was an accident. And, and he saved so little money yeah. that, that you wonder why he would do this. And then if there's a question about residency because one of the exemptions is on his home in Naperville where he had been living before he took this position and one in Chicago where he is living now. But it raises questions about where is he really living and, and there have been some other issues with uh, other uh, people in her administration. And, uh, and all of this kind of grew out of uh, the firing late last week of a spokesperson in the law department, Bill McCaffrey, who allegedly had blown the whistle to them saying, you better watch out uh, about this residency issue. You know, the press could get a hold of it. Becky, what are we to make of what happened there? Yeah, you know, I'm not so sure. And, and we haven't heard publicly from Bill McCaffrey uh, as to what, you know, reasoning was given for mm. his departure. Um, but I, I, I mean, I think there's there's also a lot of speculation on this one. and. When there's turnover in an administration, often the people who are the first to go are the spokespeople um, because they have to be sort of the voice box for these new folks. And McCaffrey was a holdover from the Emanuel. And he was, yes. Yeah, so and he had been in City Hall for a yeah, long he's time. Through three mayors, I mean, he started. He yeah. Started a well, and it was an unceremonious firing. I mean, he was escorted out uh, by security and not allowed to, you know, go back yeah. to his desk or and, anything. And it like was that. said that he was fired for cause, 
which is it means he did something bad and we got rid but of him. But they wouldn't say what that cause was. They would not say what it was, mm -hmm. but he was very and the, the problem for the mayor is that he was very well respected well, he and, said and, that, and uh, trusted. He's, he's the buddy of all the reporters in and, the room. And, and some people maybe that was a raised, problem for the mayor. Well, and some people, you know, said no, no, we can't say he's a. You know what? We were friendly with him. He was. People considered him trustworthy. If he said he didn't know something, he really didn't know it. If he if he knew something but couldn't tell you, he would say, you know what? I can't tell you right now. When we can tell you, we'll let you know. It's also important to note that that office has been a very difficult place, especially under Emanuel. They had all sorts of problems. They getting hit with sanctions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They had lawyers getting in trouble because they wouldn't follow the judge's orders. They were covering up things in the police misconduct cases. And it's never been a great intellectual firepower office. There are all these part-time lawyers who work in there. So when something goes wrong in there, McCaffrey had himself a real challenge. And a lot of times in the difficult cases, the city outsources to more expensive right. uh, private right. law firms. There was another raucous, uh, you know, legislative uh, hearing, meeting, vote this week, and that was in Washington, D.C., the impeachment of uh, President Donald Trump. Craig, um, how does this affect the 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 uh, centrist Democrats or people in swing districts in Illinois like Caston and Underwood and Bill Foster. Well, their votes are, of course, going to put targets on them. And, but they they had targets on them. I mean, uh, you know, Sean Caston uh, in Wheaton had had a target on him. Lauren Underwood had a target. It just gives their opponents more ammunition. For, which works for the people who support the president. That's the, the problem with all of this is that people have pretty much made up their minds anyway, and all of the drama around this is simply fuel, fueling fires that were already burning. It almost seems like it doesn't matter what the evidence is. Uh, now Speaker Nancy Pelosi deciding not to um, move the articles over to the Senate for trial until McConnell gives her an assurance that there will be some sort of fair trial. Lester, is, uh, are, is she going to hold them indefinitely until, until the next election? It appears that she's trying to create some sort of leverage that may not actually exist. If M McConnell can do what he wants, the Senate can do what he wants. I think from my understanding on Capitol Hill is the Senate kind of looks down on the House anyway. Sure. And they're just... Uh, I'm not sure what she has in mind here, but meanwhile, now it's delayed. She didn't appoint the House managers, the, the prosecutors who are going to present the case. And they're and off until now New it's Year. January. Right. Well, well it's, it was interesting, she, the move she made today where she uh, invited the president to, to, to give the formal invitation to give us the State of the Union speech and scheduled it for February 4th, which would, seems to, like she's trying to box in the Republicans and the president because does he want to be giving a State of the Union speech when he's in the middle of an impeachment trial? No, so that him, he may love it. <laughs> That. But I don't, I don't think his Republican colleagues want him to do that. And I think they want to have that uh, way, well out of the way before. A clear made-for-TV moment right. is something that he also loves. Uh, Becky Vivi, what about the impact on Dan Lipinski, congressman here who's going to face a primary from his left? He's sort of straddled the line in supporting Trump in some things and, and not in other things. Yeah, I mean, I certainly think that this impeachment vote is going to be a, an issue, and you, you'll see it in ads come <laughs> come springtime. But as Craig said, you know, these are these are battles that were kind of already, I think, playing out regardless of impeachment or no impeachment. All right, let's move on to some. Oh, Craig, uh, I'm There's sorry, Leslie, you want to get in One more here. point that I think we as media should consider. The Chicago newspapers basically have one reporter in Washington. covering impeachment. Mm. Lynn Sweet, she's fantastic. She's doing a great job. On Sunday evening in Chicago, there will be 11 or 12 reporters at Soldier Field watching the Bears play oh, a meaningless, a meaningless game. game. <laughs> Lester, what are we doing yeah, wrong yeah, yeah. here? Don't jump, jump the gun because we're going to talk about that meaningless yeah. game in just a minute. But first, let's get to some other political news. Former Cook County Assessor Joe Berrios, who was once one of the co county's most powerful politicians, is now reportedly under federal investigation. One of his most loyal allies, Cook County Board President Tony Preckwinkle, says, well, he's innocent until proven guilty. Meanwhile, Preckwinkle says her security guard's controversial raise was given in error. What is uh, Joe Berrios being investigated for, reportedly? Uh, the use of boats. The use of boats. Something. A barbecue Fancy grill. Barbecue. It's, yeah, a, tickets, it's, a, uh, it's a broadly stated federal subpoena. Mark Brown and Tim Novak 
and Bob Herget at the Sun Dimes did some fantastic reporting here. They got a hold of the subpoena, and the subpoena outlines an enormous investigation that includes both documents from the assessor's office, certificates of error, certificate. Th these are how you do a favor mm -hmm. for somebody on their taxes. Right, at the heart of this, they want to see if, if he was using that office to, to give for right. yeah. Fancy yeah. Tax, yeah. tax breaks, airplane yeah. yeah. tickets, and, gifts and, and boats, giving tax and everything breaks, else. And I think the reaction in Chicago was uh, not one of. Uh, shock when the news Hold came home. out. Right. Yeah. Well, we heard I mean, it he was before. ousted last year in part because of of a lot of the issues with that office and the the Tribune did all of the investigation about about the property tax assessment system and sort of the the rigging of that and we've got top politicians who are also property tax lawyers so you know I think you're right it was sort of oh of and course and his daughter no is connected to ComEd in that investigation so the whole thing is coming together in one there big. are a lot of Venn diagrams with these right. uh, you uh, investigations the threads are just, you just were, keep pulling were, you know, yeah. surprised <laughs> He's just coming under federal investigation. <laughs> I think they thought that this had we happened that already, already, but, but it actually well, he has been under federal <laughs> yeah. investigation before. But yeah. it makes you wonder why he had to leave office before we could we yeah. could learn but, all. But these one things, thing yeah. we do know for sure is Joe Barrios is going to be at the Erie Cafe yes. downtown, <laughs> holding court no matter what, which right. he was yeah. the night that story came out. And sometimes reporters went went there and tried to get him to talk, and he he wasn't talking. <laughs> and now, someone who is talking in his favor is Tony Preckwinkle. She's she's been a strong ally of his might have in part cost her this mayoral election. Why is she sticking so steadfast behind him? I, I don't know if it's, if it's, if it's loyalty. And, and she is putting some distance because she's now saying all of the investigations. And frankly, there are some other people at the county level and, and you know, there, there, obviously there's some at the state level who are being uh, in either investigated or facing charges. Uh, so, and she's the chair of the party. So I think she's she has to uh, walk a line. Yeah, she is walking a line. So she says this is all very troubling. But as she has said in every other case like this, uh, he is innocent until proven guilty. She's not necessarily defending him. She's just saying I'm not going to jump on the bandwagon now, and start beating him. She is aware of the optics. So, but like in the case of Commissioner Jeff Topolsky, who's under investigation now, she she asked him to. He's not resigning, but she asked him to give up his committee chairmanships and his and his and his other appointments because I think because of the optics of it. Tobolsky, of course, returned to work this week yeah, after being first gone. Time. He's the mayor of McCook. Right. Um, <laughs> why do we believe that it was a mistake that uh, Preckwinkle's former security got a raise to work for the Forest Preserve, and she's going to remediate that now? That's the line. Yeah, That's the, that I, there are a lot of mistakes happening. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so. I mean, until yeah. until we find evidence otherwise. Security detail is a tricky thing. Eddie Johnson got, got in trouble a, uh, with the yeah, security right. detail. Now Tony Preckwinkle. Who's next? Here's the, the, the part of this that, uh, that raises the eyebrows most, though, is that the funding for this job was transferred from her office mm. to, the, uh, to the Forest Preserve. So, and the Forest Preserve is technically a separate, separate organization. Body, it's not really. Government. It's the same yeah. people. Right. But... That, that is how the funding moved. So already there was a little bit of chess going on there. So of course people are gonna be very suspicious. They're saying he got a raise once be when he should have and then got the second raise uh, during the transfer that it automatically happened. But anyway, as they say with all things, including Mark Flesner about the, uh, the homestead exemption, the money is being paid back. The money is being paid back. All right, let's finally move to sports. The Bears failed to make the playoffs, so what's next? Rumors abound about the Cubs trading fan favorites Chris Bryant, Kyle Schwarber, and Wilson Contreras, and the White Sox pick up players that give the faithful hope for the 2020 season. Uh, Lester Munson, what kind of self-reflection does Coach Matt Nagy have to do on this year? Because <laughs> by any measure, it's a disappointment. It's a terrible disappointment. There was way too much hype to begin with. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the sports media here has been overboard on the Chicago Bears now for three years. It's embarrassing what the newspapers are doing to have all these people covering this team and nobody in Washington. But Nagy has all sorts of things to look into. The Part of the problem, obviously, is the quarterback. He had nothing to do with that. That was the general manager, Ryan Pace. Although you so, can you can uh, argue that he didn't develop the quarterback uh, the way that he promised he would. Well, but he was given this guy as opposed to other quarterbacks who are conceivably much better. So Including he, one he's going to play this week, Patrick uh, Mahomes. Sunday night, yeah. yes. The, 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 the classic Bears draft situation where they overlook 
obviously good candidates. The, the Bears this, haven't this has had... This happened over and over oh. and over again. The last great draft the Bears had was Dick Butkus and Gail <laughs> Sayers in the same That's year. A That's a pretty a good draft. Time ago. That's a yeah, pretty, that was a pretty fair but draft. But then I remember uh, Cade McNown, I think, picked oh. over some other people, maybe like Randy Moss First or round. something like that. Yeah. Um, and is Mitch Trubisky... Is is he does he have a chance to secure the starting spot next year and in, in the confidence of fans if he plays well the next two games? He's going to have the starting spot next year regardless of what happens in the next two games. Uh, they are committed to paying him. They're not going to cut him. They owe him. The the turning point will be: Will they extend his contract? Will they give up on him? Uh, or will they extend the contract? And we're not going to know next that year's until is, next is year. The last year of his last relatively year. affordable yeah. rookie right. contract. So he, he will be playing next year. Will they find someone to back him up that, that could challenge him? I, I doubt it. Uh, the backup right now is the highest paid backup in the league. They'll stay with him. Um, I, I, it's a real dilemma for the Bears for, from ownership right down to the coach. They're, they're all involved and they have a serious problem. They better hope that uh, Trubisky re really turns it on uh, these last two games. There are these signs of hope. Right. There's no question about it. And all Bears fans, they do the same thing every week. Right. <laughs> After the game on Sunday, he's terrible. Then during the week, oh, there's hope. He'll be better. <laughs> and then on Sunday, again, he crashes. So That's all we a, have because uh, unlike Becky's team, we don't draft uh, a Hall of Fame quarterback and then a Hall of Fame quarterback uh, no. right after that. And I'm speaking, of course, of the Green Bay Packers. Um, Lester, what do we expect in the, in the offseason for the Cubs and the White Sox? Well, the Cubs apparently are thinking of trading Wilson Contreras, the catcher. He's one of the best players in all of baseball. He's a future most valuable player. I cannot imagine that they will try to trade him, but apparently that is the case. They're trying to get offers. Chris Bryant, the third baseman, another good young player, he may be traded. If they trade Contreras, then it's a terrible What blunder. about Schwarber? Schwarber, I don't think you can trade him and get a lot of value. He, he's, uh, he could be a good uh, designated hitter in the American League, but everybody, th that's not a position that you trade for. So he'll, he'll be back in left field. The White Sox have lost out on some of the higher priced people they want. Uh, are, are, have they improved in the offseason? I'm not sure. The, the right fielder, Nomar, that they just signed, um, he's, ki he's kind of a Kyle Schwarber. He, 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 he can hit home runs, but he can't do much of anything else. He's not very good in the field. He, his throwing arm is not the. He has a powerful arm, but it's not accurate, and he's very slow on the bases. So I don't know that that's a great acquisition. They need a couple of pitchers. They tried. There's no question about it. But uh, same thing that has happened to the Sox before. They go to teams on either coast. All right. Well, we're out of time. You've been a great panel. Wish you all happy holidays, happy Good New Year. Thank you, thank you for being here. And for Craig Delmore, Becky Vivi, Laura Washington, Lester Munson, I'm Paris Schutz. And we'll see you on the next edition of the Week in Review. Lester, do you think uh, the Reinsdorfs have uh, uh, started to notice the empty or half-empty or apathetic Bulls fans right now? And will they make Boy, some kind of change it's there? It's unmistakable. I mean, you turn on. I, I have not been to a game there yet this year, but you turn on the TV and here are these empty seats. That's a whole new and thing. And they had how many? Uh, years of consecutive sellouts? It, years, it, well, they, they had it for 20 years after Michael Jordan oh, left, wow. and, and now all of a sudden people are catching on. That is, nothing <laughs> is, is Jim Boylan, uh, is he the problem here? I don't think so. I think uh, the people who are putting the roster together, John Paxson, G Foreman, they are the ones who are the problem. When you look at that roster, there are maybe three solid NBA players. The rest of them, the Bulls are keeping them in the league. So it's, it's very discouraging. Closed captioning is made possible in part by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices. Wishing all a happy and healthy holiday season.